Pastor Uwe. Church, good morning. good morning. I greet you today in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, you'll notice it is a communion Sunday. Normally, I would be robed for such a Sunday. I am not because it is 74 degrees in this sanctuary. Uh, Bill Donofrio is working on it. It might turn magically cool partway through. You can feel free to offer some prayers to that effect. Uh, until then, uh, I'm taking permission uh, to be a little cooler myself, if you don't mind. And in turn, I will give you all permission to shed whatever clothing you can while remaining decent. We are here to worship. And it is far more important than we be comfortable to sing our praises and hear God's word than it be that we look a certain way. Amen? And so again, as long as you stay decent, uh, by all means, try and stay cool. Uh, before we get to our worship, I do want to call your attention to a few things. Uh, first off, I want to celebrate something. Last week, if you were here, I challenged you. It was a fifth Sunday, and every fifth Sunday of the month, we take a special offering for the Kentucky Methodist Children's Home, and we've been a supporter of that church for decades, but last week was Julie Love's first Sunday as president, and I challenged you to let her know without any sh shadow of a doubt that Somerset First United Methodist Church had her back, that we are supporting her in the ministry that she is doing. And so I challenge you to give above and beyond what you normally would, and church did you. We sent a check for $690 to the Kentucky Methodist Children's Home. Please give yourselves a round of applause for that. Uh, you stepped up and uh, they know that Somerset First United Methodist Church uh, is a partner with them in that mission. So thank you so very much for doing all of that. Uh, it is, speaking of children, uh, it is a special week here at church. It is Vacation Bible School. It starts tonight with a meal at 515. We have the volunteers that we need. Thank you so much to each and every one of you who are volunteering this week. Uh, and so that means that the only job left is to bring kids here. And so if you have children, grandchildren, neighbors who have kids, right? If you're driving and you're, there's, you're at a stoplight and, and a van is next to you, shout out the window. Whatever you have to do, uh, bring these kids here uh, because Zach and his team have worked above and beyond. If you have not been down in our fellowship hall, it is transformed. Kids are going to be coming in. They're going to be learning about God's creation. They're going to be doing things like science experiments. They're going to see how incredible all the things God has made really is. And by doing that, they're going to learn how incredible God is. And that will transform transform their life. And so again, thank you to all uh, who volunteered for that uh, or are going to volunteer for that. Uh, at this point, bring children. It's going to be an incredible week. Uh, that is coming up this week, but of course, uh, today is Sunday. It is Sunday morning, and we are here more than anything else. As exciting as those things are, we are here to worship. And so I invite you uh, to shift your focus from everything going on outside uh, to be present in this place as we celebrate God's presence with us. The Lord, your God, is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget his covenant with you. If you'll please stand and join us in our hymn of praise. Thank you.
Let us pray. Almighty God, you are both ancient and new. In the past, you descended into the tabernacle of the Israelites as a physical sign of your presence with them. As we gather here in your name, we ask that you descend into our tabernacle, the tabernacle that is within our hearts, because that is truly where you belong. Give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear your understanding and wisdom. Let us renew the covenant made with you through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose holy name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Oops. Okay. Sorry about that. Now, in union with Christians throughout the world, if you'll join me in an affirmation of our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, in a life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture reading is from Exodus. And God spoke all of these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. So growing up, my mother was an avid bowler. Anyone? One person. I'll tell her you did that, Vicki. Thank you. She'll be glad to hear there's at least one kindred spirit in the room. (laughs) No, my mom would go to a bowling alley. She played in a league, like an official league, every Friday night. And occasionally, if my dad was out of town and she couldn't get a babysitter for me, she'd take me along with her. I didn't bowl. To this day, I'm awful, but I would just sit, color, do whatever. And I don't know if it was just the culture of the old steel town that I grew up in or if this is just common to all bowling alleys everywhere, Uh, but the alley on Friday night was not exactly what you would call (laughs) child-friendly. I was perfectly safe. I was perfectly safe. My mom's a good mom. I was perfectly safe. Um, I did learn a whole lot of fun new words, though, (laughs) Uh, which I will not repeat in this room. Uh, I also heard words that I already knew, but now were being used in ways I had never heard them be used before. I mean, you know this about me. I grew up in church, and so even as a child, I knew who God was. I knew who Jesus Christ was. I did know what it meant, you know, for God to damn something to hell. I had just not heard any of those words shouted at a bowling pin before. I got quite the education on those Friday nights. My experience in that bowling alley growing up, that's what we think of when we hear the scripture that you heard Arlene read. We're walking through the Ten Commandments this summer, and this one we know. The word is, uh, do not make wrongful use in the name of the Lord, but of course the more common phrase that we're used to is something more along the lines of, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, right? We know that. We've heard this a number of times, and when we hear it, we rightly infer some things from it. For instance, we rightly infer that you should not yell uh, the name of God uh, at a bowling pin, no matter how much it refuses to fall over. Um, For the all but one of you in the room uh, who don't really bowl, the situation may be different. Uh, We also should not yell it when we're walking through the bedroom and we stub our toe on that metal bar that sticks out from our mattress, right? I know it hurts, and you can yell, but maybe don't yell that name, right? Those are the kind of things that we think of. Uh, Now, some of us may 
uh, in the right context, let a few of those other words that I learned in the bowling alley uh, slip out. If we're among the right crowd of people and we want to maybe have a little bit more colorful way of expressing our language, not at church, but in other places. But even those of us who might use that language, there's still something about that name. Something about the name of God that we hold to be special. God is holy. God's name is holy. So we don't use it in fits of anger. We don't use it to be cruel, especially. We treat it with respect. And again, that is a good thing to understand from this context. That's a good lesson to learn from this third commandment, this third word. But if you've been with us the last couple weeks, you know that if we go to these commandments not looking for laws... Again, as Christians, we have one law, love as Christ loved us. But if we go to these Old Testament laws, not looking for law, but looking to learn something about what that love looks like, very often we're surprised at what we discover. We've been surprised twice already as we move through this, that there's depth to these commandments, these words, even for those of us, those people of the new covenant. We learn something about God and God's love that we never would have expected if we come at it with that spirit. And so if we go now to this third commandment, looking for more than just rules about swearing and what words to say and not to say, if we go to this third commandment looking to learn something about God's love so that we can show that love even better, this commandment's going to surprise us too. Take the word take. Just for example, uh, the Hebrew word uh, is tisa. You know a new Hebrew word now. It's tisa. It literally means to take up and carry something away. And so to translate it as take, which many of our Bibles do, it's a good translation. Do not take the name of the Lord. But I do think it's worth exploring that because we lose some of the imagery if we just say take. If we reread this commandment as do not pick up and carry off the Lord's name, then all of a sudden it gets our imaginations going. To take the name of the Lord up and carry it off to somewhere it doesn't belong, that all of a sudden broadens our understanding. And yeah, totally, right? To pick up and carry off the Lord's name and fling it at a bowling pin because a bowling pin won't fall over is to use the Lord's name in vain. Of course it is. But if we let our imaginations go, we realize that picking up and carrying off the Lord's name means so much more than just that. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that flinging the name of the Lord at a bowling pin may be the most trivial example of taking the Lord's name in vain. To make that point, let me just jump completely across the spectrum. (laughs) In the long years leading up to the Civil War, Multitudes of pastors all over America, including, I'm sad to admit, Methodist pastors, stood in pulpits very much like this one and actually claimed that slavery was God's plan for humanity. They preached that God had multiple images in mind when he created humanity in his image. They preached that that some images were white and they were meant to be free and that some images, though, were black and They were meant to not be free. These pastors from the pulpit taught that to be saved, to have salvation, meant that you learn to be content in that place reserved for your image. And so for people who were white, that meant learning to be content in their freedom. And, pointedly, for those who were black, it meant learning to be content in their slavery. And they preached this Bible in hand. They preach this quoting from God's word. They use God's word to justify owning people. They use God's word to justify beating people, to impress this lesson upon them. They use God's word to justify tearing people away from their families. They picked up the name of the Lord and they carried it off to their plantations and they attached it to slavery to justify slavery. Picking up, carrying off the Lord's name, taking it and attaching it to sin. That is taking the Lord's name in vain. 
Now, again, that's a drastic example. I understand that. We went from bowling alleys to slavery, okay? I get it. I mean, things on that end of the spectrum, we almost can't comprehend. Uh, Slavery, the Holocaust, the Rwandan genocide, Trail of Tears, all of these atrocities exist on a level that is so appalling and on such a large scale that most of us can't imagine what it would be like to live through them, not to mention vocally approve of such things. It just isn't on our radar. We don't think about it that way. I mean, as Christians... As 21st century Americans, as decent human beings, we can't imagine ever taking the Lord's name in vain by standing and claiming that God would approve of such things. But if we're truly open today, if we're truly open to hearing this word of God, if we're truly open to listening from this third commandment and what it has to teach us about God and God's love, it will not take us long to understand that there are ample opportunities for us too. Ample opportunities day in and day out in our ordinary lives to pick up and carry off the Lord's name, to attach it to something that God does not approve of, and to do irreparable harm every time that we do. One of my earliest mentors, spiritual mentors, uh, was a youth pastor I had back in high school. Her name was Jen Easley. And Jen Easley, more than almost anyone, is responsible for me hearing God's call on my heart to ministry when I did. I would have gotten to that call at some point, I think, even without Jen, but she lived and spoke in such a way that I was able to hear God calling me far earlier than most. And it really was what she said, and what she did. She showed me what it meant to be a pastor, to be in ministry, the ministry we share whether we're pastors or not. Jen Easley showed me through her words and actions that being a pastor was not just going and sitting in an office and reading and writing all week long and then standing behind a pulpit and preaching a message. That's an important thing that I do, don't get me wrong. But ministry, as you all know, because you do ministry as well, ministry is much bigger than that. Ministry means being involved in people's lives. Not just the people you like, but the people you struggle to like, even the people you dislike. Being in their lives and showing them that God cares for them and has a future for them and really, yes, can transform their life. Ministry means getting out. Getting out, getting to spaces we're not always comfortable and finding those people who feel lost or feel lonely or feel like they don't feel, fit in and going to them and saying, no, you don't understand. Here, there's this place, there's this people, there's this family where everyone can belong. It's giving people a home who don't have a home. Ministry means changing the world, helping God transform the world one person at a time. Through her words and actions, Jen Easley showed me that more than almost anybody else, and it changed my life. My life was changed forever by having Jen Easley as my pastor. But it all almost never happened. It came really close to never happening. See, up until just a few years before I met her, Jen Easley wasn't a pastor She was a geologist. (laughs) And she was a geologist because her whole life, growing up into her adolescence and young adulthood, her family had taught her and her church had taught her and her pastors had taught her that women were not meant to be pastors. They taught her that God did not intend women to be pastors. And so Jen Easley became a geologist. Until years later, when she was almost my age now, she joined a church not looking for this, just looking for a new church home. But it was a church that actually allowed women to lead and be pastors. And for the first time, Jen Easley heard a woman preach. And for the first time, Jen Easley saw a woman lead in the church. And that fire that had always been there, that God had put in her heart to pastor, it was rekindled. In fact, it was on fire more than ever before. And Jen Easley followed that passion. She answered that call, and she became a pastor. She became 
my pastor. And in large part, because she became my pastor, I am now your pastor. She answered the call, and she changed my life, and now I get to be here, hopefully, changing yours in at least a little way, by God's grace. I'm not saying all this to beat up on the churches that don't allow women to be pastors. I know that's many of them, and and it's not my place to to beat up on them. Uh, The people that that taught Jen Easley that decades and decades ago. I don't know them, but they're still my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I know that they are good people who genuinely are trying to do what they believe God wants them to do. I'm not here to beat up on them. That's not the point. The point is that I am standing here in large part because I had that female pastor in my life. And so I'm forced to confess that the people who tried to keep Jen Easley from becoming that person to keep her from being in my life when they told her that God did not intend women to be pastors, that they were taking God's name in vain. They took God's name up, they carried it off, and they attached it to something that I have to believe God does not approve of. Speaking words on God's behalf that God would never say That is what it truly means to take God's name in vain. And again, I'm not telling that story to beat up on them because I'm guilty of this too. Especially in the five years that I've been a pastor, I have realized just how guilty of this I can be. Because you know, many of you have come, if not to me, to, to other pastors in your life. You've come for advice. You've come for clarity. Come asking, what do you think God wants me to do in this situation? And it's part of our job as pastors to try and give an answer. And I've done my best, but I'll tell you, especially in the early days, I was so excited that I got to, to speak into people's lives and, and I got to share things that I believe that I didn't give sufficient thought to what I was saying. I was so caught up in the excitement of someone coming to me, right? Just like I went to Jen Easley. Now people come to me for advice. I was so excited I was not near terrified enough. I was not near humble enough at that responsibility. And church, I'll tell you, I'm not going to give you the list of bad advice that I give, but I could. I can tell you everything that I have said in five years that was not from God. I've never yelled at a bowling pin before. (laughs) But I have taken God's name in vain. I'm guilty too. And I've learned through that personal experience that whenever Christians do this, whenever Christians speak words in God's name that God would Amazing promise that God wants to change every single person. 
person's life. The most drastic change is from not being a follower of Jesus to being a follower of Jesus, but that just that is not the only change. God is not done with any of us in this room yet. Those listening online, God is not done with you yet. God wants to continue to transform our lives, and so it's just us in this room. When we speak into each other's lives, God wants to use us to help the other. God wants to use me to help you, but God wants to use you to help me. I'm not done being changed yet, and I know you're not either. The gospel is the incredible message that God is transforming all of us to love more like Jesus loves, so that we can fulfill that one commandment that we have. Our goal for each other and for the world is to help rescue each other from those powers of evil and of sin and of death, and instead to grace each other with the amazing uh, faith and hope and love that God has given us. And if we stay silent about all of that, we're betraying who we are. We're betraying our Lord Jesus. Right? We're surrendering our witness when we stay silent. We're giving up the power God has given us to save every person on the planet, including each other. We're allowing people we care about to navigate life without any of that, without faith, without hope, without love. We're leaving them to all the other powers out there. We're leaving each other to all the other powers out there. We church, we can't do that. We Christians have to speak. We have to speak on behalf of God because we cannot count on anyone else to do it for us. Again, that's terrible. That's a lot that's riding on our words. So we have to come to this commandment. We have to come to this word and we have to beg and ask the question, how do we do it right? How do we do it well? How do we speak on God's behalf? Because we have to speak on God's behalf, but how do we do it without taking God's name in vain? Well, in three words, humbly, carefully, and prayerfully. When we speak humbly, we speak every sentence with the understanding of what I just shared. We speak everything the understanding that because we bear the name Christian, everything we do represents God to other people. Everything. People know God through us. And so the very words we use convey the kind of God we believe in. And I'll tell you, that awareness alone, understanding the power of our words alone, that we are God to people, it will probably cut the words we use in each day if you're like me. That's probably no bad thing. We will talk less. That's what it means to speak humbly. To speak carefully, though, that means to actually think through what we say. Again, I'm guilty of this. I like to ramble. I call it being a verbal processor, but that's just an excuse. I like to talk. But if I'm speaking carefully, it means that I spent infinitely more time thinking than talking, processing the people I know, the situations I'm likely to be in, the world that I live in, and so that when I do speak, I'm speaking things that have gone through, that I've processed, that I've prayed over, that I've thought about. It means that when I speak to someone, I care enough about that person to only speak the best of what goes through my mind, right? You're like me in this, don't deny that you're not. Of all the things that we think, how many are worth saying? We think a whole lot of things that should never leave our mouths. Amen? <laughs> the critical of prayer is take off the top that little bit that is worth sharing. That's what it means to speak carefully. It's an old saying, but it's one that I've used increasingly for myself. Only speak if what you're saying. 
praying before we speak, but actually I want to talk about the other side of it. If we speak prayerfully, it means we don't forget the things we said. Especially when we've offered advice, or if we've shared what we think is right, or especially if someone's asked us, what do you think God wants for me, and we've answered that question, we don't forget what we said. And we go to God afterwards, and we pray, and we ask God to reveal to us if it was the right thing or not. Was it kind and true and necessary and improvement upon the silence or, or not? Right? And if our words have helped others, well, then we get to celebrate. Not everything we say is bad. We're Christians. We have God's spirit. Sometimes we say the exact right thing to the exact right people at the exact right time. And you know what, church? If you have done that, give thanks for that. Don't just like brush it off as if it's nothing. It's not nothing. You just changed the person's life. Give thanks, and if you give thanks for it, if you appreciate that God's working through you that way, you know what's going to happen. You're going to be better able to do it the next time around. And you're going to give thanks then, and you're going to get better and better. I have grace at that. If you've done well, celebrate it and give thanks for it. If you've not, I've already said, I often don't. I know we all have not at some point. The temptation is to forget about it. I said something that was wrong, that was hurtful. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to acknowledge that I'm the kind of person that can say things like that. I want to move on with my life, and I want to dearly hope that they'll move on with their lives too. It does not work that way. When we injure others, when we break our relationship with others, it does not just naturally heal. They might heal by God's grace. We will not, and that relationship will not, unless we can. We have to go to God perfectly. When we realize what we've said, we have to apologize. It's basic stuff, but we have to ask forgiveness from God first, right? You know what you did now. I know what I did now. I took God's name, carried it off, and attached it to something that was far more about me than it was of God. I have to apologize to God for that. I made God look bad as someone who needed God, and I need be forgiven for this. But if I've done that, that frees me to have forgiveness from the people I spoke to. It gives me the chance to heal the damage I've done. It's not always going to work out that way. But at least it gives me the chance, it gives God the chance to use me to heal that relationship, to heal the damage that I've done. That's what it means to speak prayer. When we do those three things, when we speak humbly, we speak carefully and we speak prayerfully. That is what we have truly learned from this commandment. That is truly what it means to not take God's name in vain, but to only say words that God will receive. I love that it's a communion Sunday. I love communion Sunday regardless. But I love that it's today. Because communion is always a time for confession and forgiveness. It's a time to receive God's grace in a myriad of ways, but today I'm going to challenge you to do something in particular. I want you to come to this table today and bring all your words with you. <laughs> all of them. I want you to bring the good words. You've spoken to someone and they are better for it, and they know God loves them more, and they're able to love others more. Bring those words and give thanks to God for them. But bring those other words too. The words you don't want to remember, the words you don't want to acknowledge, the words you don't want to admit you would ever say, bring those. <coughs> Ask forgiveness for saying that. Then you know what I want you to do? I want you to leave them at the table. Don't take those words back with you. No one needs to hear those. They don't represent who God is. Leave them here. I promise I'm not going to do anyone any harm at this table. Come and leave them. And in that hole, I have absolute faith that God will give you new words. In leaving words that did not represent who God was, God will give you words that do. You might not recognize it right away. But if you leave those old words here, you'll find yourself out living life. And all of a sudden, someone comes to you and you say something and without having planned it at all, you will realize that was exactly the right thing. That that person's life is changed for the better. If you leave the old words here, God will give you new words. So I invite you as we prepare our hearts.
Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the new good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you're forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. So there's an ancient practice of the church where once the people have been forgiven, they celebrate their forgiveness by greeting one another. I know many of you miss that we greet each other every Sunday. So I thought I'd revive this ancient practice. Please come our communion Sundays and give you the chance to celebrate being a forgiven and reconciled people. So as the ushers come forward, I invite you to take just a moment and stand and greet the people around you. If you'd like to use the traditional phrase, it's peace be with you. Peace be with you, my friend. And also with you. Would you be seated and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we know that everything we have, every blessing we enjoy, ultimately comes from you. And so in thanksgiving and appreciation, we now give back a portion of what we have received. That your kingdom may grow. That your children, the world over, would have the food and shelter they need. And would know the love that comes from belonging to your family. We pray this in the holy and special and perfect name of the one who came, who died, but who yet lives even now, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right, and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave the cup to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As our servers come forward, I'll remind you again that this is not my table or this church's table, but Jesus' table. And it's open to all. Anyone who senses that there's something at this table they need is welcome to come. And so I'll serve our servers, and we'll move down to the front of the center aisle. As the ushers guide you, come forward. We'll break off a piece of bread and hand it to you. Don't eat it right away. Take a step forward, dip it in the cup, then eat. Again, I invite you to then come forward to kneel. Bring your words with you, but don't take them all back with you. The table's prepared. The invitation is given. Come as you are led. Anyone who needs served where they are seated.
There's a hole where those words have left. I invite you to fill it with words of praise. Would you stand and join us as we sing our closing hymn? heaven. Go carrying those words out with you. May every word you speak show God for who God is, and may others be drawn closer because of you. Go with the assurance that it is not on your own efforts, but the Spirit working through you. And go as you always do go. In the name of the God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.